can afford anything, you just can't afford everything. Every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else, and that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to your time, your focus, your energy, your attention, any limited resource that you need to manage. Saying yes to something implicitly carries an opportunity cost, and that opens up two questions. First, what matters most? Second, how do you align your decision-making, both at the daily and at the big picture level, around that which matters most? Answering those two questions is a lifetime practice, and that is what this podcast is here to explore and facilitate. My name is Paula Pat. I'm the host of the Afford Anything podcast, and today, Nick Majuli joins us to talk about why you should just keep buying. I've been following Nick on Twitter for a long time, and he, like Morgan Housel, like James Clear, he has a talent for questioning the dominant paradigms or the rehashed or repeated assumptions that we often hear. He questions those backs it with data, and does so in a way that is clear, compelling, and tells a story. Oftentimes in the financial press, you'll hear intellectually lazy, unbacked assumptions that get repeated so often that they become part of the zeitgeist. So, for example, you might hear headlines repeat, millennials are building wealth at a slower pace than prior generations, or millennials aren't saving enough for retirement, or they're too scared to invest or Gen Z is drunk on crypto, they're taking on too much risk. You hear these tropes that get repeated in the headlines and reiterated to the point where they become unquestioned assumptions. What Nick does very well is he parses through the data to arrive at sound, data-backed conclusions about the world of personal finance. His website, appropriately, is called ofdollarsanddata.com. And he is a data scientist and chief operating officer at Ritzhold Wealth Management. He holds an economics degree from Stanford. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal. His name was recently mentioned on the Tim Ferriss podcast as a leader in great personal finance thought. In our upcoming conversation, we discuss many concepts, including the saving and investing continuum, the 2x rule, how to create a framework to think through income earning opportunities the balance of speculative assets versus income-producing assets in a portfolio, and much more. Nick is also the author of a new book called Just Keep Buying, which contains many practical and data-driven strategies around saving and investing. Here he is, Nick Majuli. Hi, Nick. How you doing, Paula? I'm great. How are you? Doing good. Nick, one mistake that you have publicly talked about was that when you were in your 20s, you made the mistake of prioritizing your investments. And that sounds counterintuitive to everyone who's listening. Can you describe what you did and why it was erroneous in hindsight? Yeah. So when I first got out of college, you know, I started reading a lot of investment books. I was like, I'm going to get this right. I knew my asset allocation. I really, I obsessed over it kind of. I was like, oh, do I need to have 10% in bonds or 5% or 15? Maybe I'm not taking enough risk. All these concepts that you read about in theory, and now you're kind of seeing it play out. Now you actually have money on the line, right? Versus just reading about it in college, right? So started earning just a little bit of money, you know, started saving and all that. And I spent so much time, I had spreadsheets, I had net worth projections, all these crazy things I had. And I didn't realize I was spending all this time on this thing, which was kind of cool in its own right. But like at the same time, I was going out with my friends in San Francisco and just partying all night and I'd easily spend a hundred dollars. And so like, let's say, for example, when I first started, like after, you know, maybe a month or a couple months, I had probably a thousand dollars in my 401k, right? Let's say I could get a 10% return on that 401k, right? So in a year, I could probably earn about a hundred dollars, right? In investment returns, assuming I just kept it at a thousand. So in one year's investment returns, I was blowing in one night, like with my friends, just going out, like just regularly. (laughs) And so what I realized, I only, I didn't realize it then. I didn't realize it much later, probably five, six years later, like, why was I obsessing over my investment so much when like what I really should have been focusing on was like either my spending or like, how could I raise my income? How could I improve my career? Things like that. And so when I say I made a mistake, I don't think I made like a major flaw, but I just, I could have been more optimal. I could have said, you know what? It doesn't really matter what my investments are doing right now. Cause I don't have that much money yet. And for a lot of young people, that's going to be true. And I know people like, Hey, I got $500. Like, where do I put it? I just saved it. And like, it's good to be thinking about that and be like, that's a positive, you know, you kind of want to think about investments because you're even thinking about it at the same time. Like 
I think it's going to be more impactful for a lot of young people to focus on their career and see kind of how they can get their earning power higher over time, because that's going to allow you to save, oh, 500. No, now you're going to be saving, oh, I can save $5,000, right? That's going to be far more impactful for you than what you do in the short run. And don't get me wrong. I know about compounding and doing all that. Trust me. I know that matters when you start earlier, not telling people not to get invested. Of course, I would never say that. At the same time, though, don't obsess over it. Just put it in something. Don't worry about if the mix is perfectly right. Mm -hmm. Just kind of get started and focus on like where you're spending your time. And as you get older and actually have more money invested, then you can start worrying about like what's the precise asset allocation. That's where it starts to matter. Right. So the thing that people overlook is that your contributions are the single biggest determinant of your success. Mm -hmm. Especially early on. I mean, later, of course, like uh, later, it's definitely going to matter like what your investment returns are. You know, one of the best stories, so this is going back to more, something Morgan Housel said, is like if you took Warren Buffett and you gave him the same returns from age 30 to where he is today or, you know, wherever he wrote the article a couple of years ago, he's like, the reason he got to where he's today, because at age 30, he had like a couple million bucks with him. So this is back in like the 60s or something. Mm -hmm. The same returns he gets to like 60, 70 billion or whatever he had at the time, right? But let's say he only had like 100,000 or he had like, you know, $10,000 at age 30. Like he'd only have a billion dollars at age 70. It's, it's like that initial, having that initial mass of money was much more important for Warren Buffett in the long run than his investment returns. So they both matter, but like having that initial set of money is going to matter a lot more. Right. But I'll make the devil's advocate argument here. And this actually is something that came out of your book. You also make the point that if you ask people if they would want to trade places with Warren Buffett today, with Warren Buffett being 87 years old, right? Mm -hmm. If you could have all of the wealth of Warren Buffett, but also the age of Warren Buffett, a lot of people would say no. A lot of people intuitively understand that time is their most important asset and would not choose to be 87 or 88 or however old he is, even if it meant having all of his wealth. And so the fact that you were blowing a hundred bucks a night going out in San Francisco, those are cherished memories in your life. Those are experiences. And we know that experiences, spending money on experiences derives a certain level of happiness. So would that not be a laudable form of spending? Oh, of course. When I was making this argument about me not behaving optimally, I was not saying I shouldn't have been going out with my friends. And I'm, that's not kind of the takeaway I want people to have. I'm sorry if that's kind of what I was leading for. Mm -hmm. The takeaway was I shouldn't have been spending so much time looking at my investments. In those couple of hours, I might have been looking at a spreadsheet every week. Right. I could have been learning a new skill or doing something else. Yeah, it's not that my spending was the issue. It's that my where my focus on income was not the issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, what I was doing with my time, like instead of focusing on the investments, I should have been focusing on, you know, how can I grow my income? And that's kind of the thing I thought I think would have been better. It's not like, oh, my gosh, I never should have hung out with friends. It's just I'm trying to show the absurdity of it because I went out basically every weekend. And so because of that, like you can see, like, you know, I could have skipped one weekend. Yes. But like it's not about that. It's more about like thinking about like where are you spending your time? So you bring up this example of Warren Buffett. And I think that's why it's such a useful example because you you intuitively understand you wouldn't trade places with Buffett today because like, yeah, you you don't have as much time now. And, I, and Warren Buffett, someone's like, would Warren Buffett give up half his fortune to be like 30 or 35 today? He would give up all of it. He'd probably go into debt. I'd actually argue he would go into massive amounts of debt to be 35 today. Like he would probably say, give me a million bucks in debt. I don't care. Like he could get out of it. I'm pretty sure. Like even imagine you take his connections too. So he just still has his brain, but he gets to go back in time and like, or not back in time, but he gets to go, you know, and be 35 again, I think he would go into debt. And I think a lot of people who are like that would do the same. Yeah. And so all of that leads to one of the first rules that you introduce, which is to think about if your savings exceeds your investment income or not. Can you talk about the distinction between that in terms of how the people who are listening to this should be thinking about what they should be focusing on? Yeah. So kind of going back to me, like where I should have been spending my time when I was in my early 20s, mm -hmm. I kind of came up with something called the save invest continuum. And basically all you need to know about like everyone's on this continuum. And it's a question of like, you know where you are kind of based on two numbers, right? And they're all relative to your life. So the first number is like, how much could you save in the next year? Like reasonably. So let's say you can save 500 bucks a month. You do that for 12 months. Mm -hmm. That's $6,000. So that's, that's number one, six grand, right? That's how much you could save. And then how much can your money earn you in the next year? So let's say you have $20,000 invested. You're going to get, let's say, a 5% return. You're expected 5% return like in an average year. Okay, so that's $1,000. So that's your second number. Your expected investment return is 1000 So now compare those two. Which one's bigger? The 6000 expected savings or the 1000 expected investment return? And in this case, because the 6000 is bigger, you need to spend more time focusing on how you get and how you can raise 
your savings, and then put that into investment so you get your investment income up over time. You know, when I was starting this whole thing, like, you know, in my early 20s, my expected investment income was, as I said, like $100 or something, <laughs> maybe 500 bucks, whatever. It was, it was small, right? right? In a given year, it was very, very small. And that's with a 10% return. So I was actually pretty liberal with the return. But my expected savings was much higher. I could probably save a couple thousand dollars in a year, right? So a couple thousand versus a hundred, it's not even close. I should have been focusing much more on what I was doing, how I was raising my income to save more money. And that's what you need to do. Because over time, you're going to see this flip, right? Mm -hmm. There's like the save, invest continuum. There's also a phrase I use to kind of represent this. And I say, savings for the poor, investing is for the rich. Now, when I say poor, I don't mean that in absolute terms. I always mean this in relative terms. And I mean this relative to yourself. Like if you do this properly, if you're in your early 20s, you start saving money, investing, your wealth starts to grow, you will be relatively richer in your future than you were when you started. It doesn't mean you're going to be in the 1% or you're a billionaire. It doesn't mean any of that. It doesn't mean you're in abject poverty if you're living in San Francisco as a 22-year-old college grad. Like, no, that's not what I'm getting at. It's about the relative difference. And so when I say that, it's like, you're going to see over time in future years, if you do this right, like when you're older, you can lose more money in a year from your investment returns than you could ever expect to save. Like if there's a bad year in the market, like there's nothing you could do to like make up for that. Like let's say you have a $10 million investment portfolio, hypothetically, this is a really extreme case, right? A 10% drop is a million dollars. Like how are you going to say, save a million dollars after tax in a year? It's not possible for most people unless you have a very, very high paying job. For most people, let's say you could, even if you could save 100,000, which is a lot of money, that's still 10X more, you know, taking a 10% drop, that's not that outrageous. Like those things happen pretty often. I think when you think of it that way, you start to realize like, oh my gosh, no wonder, like your investments don't really matter as much when you have very little invested. But as you kind of have a lot more invested, that's all that matters because it can have a bigger impact on your wealth than anything you do personally. So that's kind of what's happening is over time, you should see that transition. So early on, like, I'm at a point now where I'm kind of in the middle where I kind of have to focus on both. I can't just focus on one another, but I've been working for 10 years. So I should expect something like that around this 10 to 20 year mark. You should start to see that happen. And so what does it mean to focus on both for the people who are listening, who also find themselves in the middle and they hypothetically can save 6,000 a year and their investments will return around 6,000 a year, right? They find themselves right at that midpoint. What should they do in order to focus on both? You just got to, you got to get educated in both. So in terms of the saving stuff, you got to be like, what can I do to, you know, improve my career, do things I care about, whatever that is, there's that piece. And on the investment side, you do have to care about your asset allocation. You have to care about, you know, timing decisions and like, what are you doing? Are you making timing decisions or not, et cetera, right? right? The thing is when you're very young, it doesn't really matter as much what you're doing with your money on the investment side. But as you get very old, that's all that matters. Like think if you retire, you have no income, you have no way to save, right? Right. So, or maybe you have social security or something, but once you have very little savings, then all that matters is the market. And so you have to really think about that a little bit more and kind of understand what you're doing, tax things. All There's all these things that there's taxable consequences. And I'm not trying to get into all of that right now, but you can understand how like your tax consequences of your investments probably matter a lot more when you're 65 than when you're 25, right? So thinking about those things is, is what's important. So people in the middle just... I mean, there's no easy answer. It's it's the toughest part. It's like the middle middle life so is the toughest part of life in general, but let alone because like for on a financial perspective, because you have to care about everything. You kind of have to care about everything. You can't just focus on one or the other. Right. And if you are in that space where you find, regardless of your age, you find that you've amassed a large enough portfolio that your investment returns are greater than any amount that you could reasonably save in a given year, could that be the new definition of retirement? The only problem with that is it doesn't take into account your spending. Mm. Let's say I could save $1,000 in a year, but mm -hmm. I could get $10,000 from my investment portfolio. If I'm spending 20 grand a year, then you can see like sure. that's a problem, right? So that it doesn't solve that. The whole point of the save and invest continuum is figuring out where to focus. That's the point of that. It's just like, where should I spend my time, right? Everything kind of goes back to time eventually. Like it's your most important asset because we just talked about that. But figuring out where you spend that time is one thing. But yeah, whether that's, I don't know if you can consider retirement, you yeah. need to take into account your spending, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you start to spend more, you can save less, but then is your investment income enough to offset that, right? And when it is, it's good. But if it's not, you got to keep saving, you know, until you get there. Right. Yeah. No, I, I guess in my head, I'm imagining uh, fairly large numbers and I'm imagining, you know, if a, person, <laughs> if a person gets to that point where your expected investment returns are dwarf anything that you could reasonably save. I mean, oftentimes I hear my audience say, how do I know when? And that could be one of many signals that might indicate a certain level of when. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, I think 
there's the, the crossover rule. That's a great one. Vicki Robin, she talks about that in Your Money or Your Life. And she's just like, once your expected investment returns surpass your expected spending over a given period, then you're kind of at your crossover point where your investments basically can pay for your lifestyle, right? Right. Of course, if there's a market crash or something, that's not always true. There, you have to have a little, there's a little bit of you know de-risking you have to do, but you could imagine you there's some people out there that are at that point. That's a decent proxy is once your investment returns exceed your spending. Right. Let's talk a little bit more. So you talk both about how to improve your savings rate and, and savings by that definition is your income minus your spending, right? So it's not necessarily frugality. It's increasing the gap between what you earn and what you spend. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you talk about is the 2X rule. Can you describe that? When I'm talking about the 2X rule, I think I think there's a lot of stuff in the personal finance space where a lot of people are guilted into, you know, you have to, oh, you don't buy your coffee, you're paying away a million dollars. You've heard, I mean, you've heard a lot of these things, you know, you should reuse your dental floss or make your <laughs> yes. own laundry. So and I've heard it all. I'm like, what is this the new thing that they're pushing, right? And so I know I've read your work, Paul. I know you're against a lot of this guilt stuff. You can't afford this. You can't afford that. I, I understand you're you're all against that stuff as well. And so for me, I think I am trying to come up with different ways that people, different tricks people can use to kind of get them out of that guilt. There's this spending guilt that's mm -hmm. out there. And so one of the tricks I use, if I'm ever splurging, it's not for something like when I go to buy eggs or something, I don't care about that, right? But like if I'm splurging, like if I want to take myself out, go out for a nice dinner, buy myself a nice pair of shoes or something, right? Whatever it is. If I ever spend a, a large amount of money, let's say I'm going to spend three hundred dollars, four hundred bucks, whatever it is, I make sure to take the same amount of money and I either invest it, right? So let's say, so if I'm going to buy a three hundred dollar pair of shoes, like a nice pair of dress shoes, I will take another three hundred dollars, so two x my original purchase price, and I will invest it in something, or I can donate it. There's different ways you can do this to kind of get rid of the guilt, so you don't feel guilty about buying the shoes because you're like also investing for your future, or you're also helping a good cause, or something like that. So I think this rule is really effective not only from like an you know affordability perspective, because if you can save 2X for it, then you can obviously afford the first X, so to speak. Right. Uh, but also it really eliminates spending guilt in a lot of ways. And I think that a lot of the personal finance issues out there are, you know, issues that are in people's heads and they get, oh, should I not spend this? And they're very frugal and there's nothing wrong with being frugal. But there are times when, hey, you want to splurge on yourself a little, it's okay. And this is a way to kind of you know allow yourself to do that. You also talk about the importance of saving Roughly half of your future raises. Uh, and But there's actually a more complex formula that you walk through. Can you walk us through this? To be honest with you, there isn't actually like a hard formula because it's – I had to simulate a bunch of data and then I basically solved all the answers. I don't know. There's no formula. I can say give me X and I'll give you Y. It doesn't – it's not a simple mathematical formula because you're, you're basically taking someone who's like in a steady state. Hey, I'm saving X dollars per year. I'm making it to my retirement goal. They're on basically a path. They're on this like equilibrium, perfect world where you get the same investment return every year. You're saving X dollars per year. You're moving to this path, right? So you can just imagine like someone's in a perfect equilibrium state. They're going to hit their retirement. They're going to spend, you know, 4% of your retirement, et cetera, and everything's perfect. Obviously, this is not realistic, but just go with it for now. Right. Now, let's say there's a, a positive shock to the system. And when I say positive shock, I just mean you get a raise, you get a bonus, right? So what should you do to make sure you still land at the same equilibrium, right? So you're saying, oh, if I got a raise or a bonus, then that's only good, right? Because if I save the entire raise, then I can just retire earlier. That's one option. But what if you want to spend a little bit of the raise? Like, you know, if you spend all of the raise, the problem is you're actually going to retire later. It's very counterintuitive. Saying, how is that possible? How me spending all of my raise means I'm going to retire later? Well, assuming you want to spend the same amount of money over time, right? You want to have some sort of like lifestyle. Maintenance. Uh, yeah, maintenance, exactly. You know, over time. Assuming that's true, if you're spending this raise, you know, you weren't spending that money in the past, but now you are, that means you have to save more to keep spending at that level in retirement. So there's only two ways. You either spend your raise and as soon as you hit retirement, you drop your lifestyle to back to what it was before the raise, right? Let's say you have another 10 grand a year to spend, right? And you spend that, I don't know, on, I'm just making something. Let's say you buy a jacuzzi every year for $10,000, just buy a new jacuzzi every year. That's just part of your lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you hit retirement, you can't do that anymore. The jacuzzi has gone. You have to go back to however you lived before jacuzzi time, right? Mm -hmm. You could do that. But let's say you want to keep doing that jacuzzi stuff forever, then you're going to have to find a way to like, you're going to have to work longer or something like that. So I think that there's no real formula for it. Generally, I find that as long as you save at least half of your raises, 
you will be fine. Like for most savings rates, as long as you save at least half, if not more, then you can stay kind of, you can keep your spending pretty constant over time. Like you can even allow your spending to go up because remember, if you save half, that means you're spending the other half by definition. I think it's a cool way to think about this because so many people in personal finance space just say, hey, like, no, you should save every dollar of your raise. And of course, if you're far behind and you're not even close to reaching a retirement goal, you should do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, this is a way of like, okay, maybe you're on some path and now you need to know like, okay, what should I do now? And so I've used data and I've kind of like simulated this thought experiment to see what would happen in all these cases. And so basically I find that, yeah, if you're saving a lot of money already, you should save at least 50% of your raise. And if you're not saving a lot, you should save roughly at least 50% of your raise. So I, I think it works well. With it, it just by chance, it kind of, I don't know what the right word is here, but the answer of 50% just kind of, it was around that answer. It's not, there's no perfect end. You'll see, I have a table of like, if you're saving straight 25%, <laughs> you need to save X percent of your raise. If right. it's 30%, you need to, I, mm -hmm. so I kind of give you what the, you know, I break it out in the, in the book of the exact figures, but I said like 50% is like a rough round answer of where it needs to be. And it fits well with the two X rule. So I can kind of reuse the rule, right? So it's easier to remember. I think that's the main takeaway there. You doesn't have to be exact or everything. Just kind of think about like, you know, half's for me and, and the other half's for future me, right? That's kind of the simplest way to think about it. If people do that, they'll be far better off. And it allows for some lifestyle creep. I think lifestyle creep's okay. And I think just saying, oh, you can't have any lifestyle creep. That's terrible. Like, what? what's the point of working so hard if you can't enjoy at least a little bit of it? So I'm saying enjoy half of it. And I've solved it. I've shown mathematically you can do this. Instead of guilt tripping people into, like, not spending any of their raises or enjoying, you know, uh, celebrating. Right. Now, a lot of raises are essentially inflationary increases. You know, if inflation is 3% and your raise is also 3% or maybe 4%, then the raise is functionally a cost of living increase. Does this apply to only the portion of your raise that is in excess of that inflationary increase? Yes, of course. Yeah, of course, that's true. Yeah. So obviously, I don't know if I mentioned that specifically, but yeah, we were taught everything was supposed to be real returns, like inflation adjusted returns, because yes, yeah. if we are talking about, yes, inflation's going up every year, if inflation's 8% and you've got a 7% raise, yeah. you can't go spend half of that 7% raise. You're actually now, and you're actually spending. <laughs> yeah, that. you actually got to pay. Your real income has gone down. Yeah. So right. of course, this would be real raise, any sort of real inflation adjusted raises, of course. Given our earlier conversation about the fact that your contributions are the single biggest determinant of the success of your portfolio and the growth of your net worth, many people who are listening to this want to increase their contributions and need to increase their income in order to do so. However, there are a variety of ways that people can increase their income, and those options come with their own advantages and disadvantages. Can you enumerate some of these options and the pros and cons of each? Yeah. So when I uh, discuss this in the book, how you can increase your income, I have five different, or technically there's six different ways. Well, the six is kind of a surprise we'll get into at the end, but there's like five different ways I think people can increase their income. Some of these are, you know, main hustle things, as they say, in terms of your, your core job. And some are, you know, side hustles or other things you can do on the side, whether it's freelancing, stuff like that. So I'm going to kind of talk about each one of those. So the first one I, I talk about is like selling your time or expertise. Mm -hmm. The thing about selling your time, like you can go and, you know, uh, work for someone else, have a part-time job, you know, you're an expert in a specific thing and you can maybe tutor someone, teach someone something. Those are easy ways to kind of do that. Right. The pros, obviously they're easy. There's low startup costs of doing that. There's even like, you know, stuff like Instacart and all sorts of stuff now where you can just sign up quickly and start doing something for someone else. Right. The con is like your time's limited. It's not really going to scale in the same way, right? As something like selling a product, which we'll get into in a second here. What strikes me as I hear you talk about this is that this applies both to gig economy work, Instacart, driving for Uber, as well as for more specialized work like freelancing or consulting. In either case, there are low barriers to entry, low barriers to getting started, low startup costs, but it's not scalable. Exactly. The alternative, instead of just say, okay, well, I don't just want to sell my time. I want to sell something that's not completely linked to my time. And that's what my second thing is, well, if you, you could sell a skill or service, right? So- that's still going to be obviously linked to your time if you have a certain skill for doing something or you have a service you provide to someone. It, mm -hmm. If you get better at that thing, you can still charge the same price. And if you can just lower the amount of time it takes, you can just you can sell it for more. Right. So you can think of that being like, let's say you're great at photography or something. Right? You can just and you can or even developing photos or Photoshop is an example of that where that's a skill you're selling. You can sell that and they have no idea how much time you take to do it. Right. And they're not explicitly paying you for the time. Right. So mm -hmm. that's something 
where you can get higher pay. You can build a brand around it about a marketable skill or something. The con, I guess, is like it just takes time to develop a skill. Like skills are not easy to develop. There's a lot of things out there where you can make money. And just when you're just selling your time, you don't need to have too much skill. But then there's things out there where you need to spend that time to either develop a skill or develop expertise or something. And that's also not going to scale too greatly for most things. Like if you're just selling a skill or service, um, there are some ways it can scale. But generally, you know, if you need to you know, do 10 Photoshop things, you have to, it's still some time. So still, they're very similar one and two, but I think there, there's a slight distinction there. Right, right. And it seems to me that in order to stand out from the crowd, you would need some sort of niche differentiation. Yes, exactly. And I, so you have to find that's, that's where brand building comes in, right? I think that's, right. that's an important point to bring up. The next thing you can do is just teach people. And I think like teaching people, whether they're doing it online or in person, if you can do like an in-person course, and in-person courses are harder, but now there's so many different online courses that I've seen people build courses and they either do cohort based or they do ones where they just record themselves in a video and they teach people or even, you can even think of YouTube as kind of like a teaching platform. And that's very scalable, right? You, I mean, you can have millions of people watching you on YouTube, right? If you're, if you're teaching about something, right? Versus if you're just doing it in person or something like that. The problem is there's lots of competition because it's so lucrative and can be so lucrative. There's a lot of people on YouTube. There's a lot of people on these teaching platforms. So once again, it's about branding and how do you stand out? How do you attract students? It's going to be an ongoing battle to do this, right? To keep getting people to come in. So how do you kind of keep create a referral network? So that's another way of thinking about it. Another way you can increase your income. The fourth thing is selling a product. So if you create a product, you know, that's obviously very scalable because if you can create a product in a way that's you can create a lot of them, or even especially a digital product can be very scalable. Like I just write for, I write a digital book once and I can sell it N infinite times in theory, right? Mm -hmm. The other issue is there's lots of upfront investment there and a lot of marketing, right? To do something like to sell a product. There are pros and cons to each one of these things. Those are like, those are all those first four are basically all like kind of side hustle gig economy things. Yeah. Would it be accurate to say, based on what I've heard you uh, just describe, would it be accurate to say that there is an inverse relationship between scalability and startup cost? There can be in a lot of cases, right? Like maybe there's some like Goldilocks zone or some magical outlier out there. But generally, like if you're selling a product, like the only way you sell a product that people like, it's really good. It's generally has to be like pretty good. You have to have some deep skill or expertise in creating that product or something, right? It's not going to just come to you out of nowhere, right? Like, right. so the only one I'm doing on this list right now is I'm selling a book, right? And it's like, and I did that by writing online for five years about investing and reading so much and investing and doing this stuff. So it took five years of work to even get to something that I could actually, you know, create and send out there. Right. So it takes time and you have to do it. And I wasn't really being compensated for it until like 2020 I started running some side ads on my uh, website. So I was trying to get some compensation for that. But for three years, it was free. It was nothing mm -hmm. for no ads, nothing on there. And so I just, I was just working for nothing basically just doing because I loved it. Right. So that's an example of like, you have to put out, there's a long runway, but then, you know, maybe you can pay off one day. Who knows? Right. Mm. And then the last thing I want to say is climbing the corporate ladder. I know a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, you got to start your own thing. You got to be your own business owner, this and that. But I think for a lot of people, just being a, a professional, a corporate professional, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a nine to five. And there's a lot of people that do well in that environment. And there's a lot of people that you can build a lot of wealth there. There's a lot of millionaires that are doing nine to fives. It's not about like, oh, my gosh, I have to run my own business and all this and all that because it's not necessary. Right. There's a lot of people that can do that. And so. The pro of working in a corporate environment is you're going to gain skills and experience. You're going to work with lots of people. There's going to be a lot more exposure for you versus you're trying to do something on your own, right? Um, and there's less risk around your income growth because generally, you know, most over time, a lot of positions, you know, you'll get promoted, your income goes up. And we've seen that this is true generally. You look in the data and this is true for most people in these kind of corporate environments. It generally goes up and then obviously does level off at some point. But for a lot of people, it does keep going up into, you know, from your 20s, 30s into your 40s even. The only problem is... You don't control what you're doing. You don't really control your time in the same way, right? So that's something to think about, right? It's the downside. But yeah, and the, the last thing, so that's the, the main hustle. The last way to raise your income, number six, is buy more income-producing assets. Think like an owner. You know, that's really the best way to raise your income because going back to what we said with the Save Invest Continuum, you're you're taking money out of savings. You're taking your savings and you're investing it, and that's going to raise your income and raise your income and raise your And that's the ultimate goal. All of these ways of raising your income should be funneled into income-producing assets, which do it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the ultimate goal eventually. So I think that's kind of a, a good way to think about it is like all of these things you're doing to raise your income, the point is to get that money invested so that it keeps paying you. You don't have to keep working for it. Right. So yeah, it's essentially what you're doing is selling your time as a stepping stone to allowing your money to make money for you. 
Exactly. You're taking your human capital and converting it into financial capital. And that's kind of how I like to think about it. It's almost like you're rebuilding yourself as a financial asset equivalent. And of course, this is very weird to say things like this, but like you're basically saying like, hey, I only have so many, so many hours I'm going to be able to work the rest of my life. You can think of your human capital as like always a dwindling asset, not because you can't learn new skills, but you just you're going to run out of time eventually. Right. So over time, your time, you know, in theory, you're your time's going down. So while that's happening, while your human capital is decreasing, you need to offset that by increasing your financial capital. So it's it's paying you even when you can't work anymore, right? That's kind of the idea. Right. So let's talk about owning income producing assets because you make a distinction, as do I, as, as I've said um, many times to this audience, that any asset earns money in one of two ways, either through capital appreciation or and or through the dividend or income stream that it pays off. But there are certain assets that only earn or lose money via capital appreciation, and those are speculative, the ones that don't have any kind of income stream attached to them. And I see that you, like me, tend to not prioritize those more speculative assets as much. Can you talk about how you came to that decision and from there lead us into a conversation about specifically the income-producing assets? As you mentioned, like you said, there's two ways. There's basically like there's price changes and how people feel about prices. That's one thing, what people think something's worth. Mm -hmm. And then there's something which a lot of people might call fundamentals or earnings or income. There's different ways of discussing that. And those things, I think, are more weighted in some sense of reality. Right. And so Mm -hmm. the example I like to give, you know, imagine there's this factory they're selling for, you know, a million dollars. But, you know, this factory is producing, you know, half a million dollars of profit every year. Right. And so it's like, wow, that's a great like, why wouldn't I two X earnings? That's incredible. It's incredibly that's uh, the pricing is great. Right. So it's like you can say it's worth 10 million or 1 million or whatever, no matter what that anchors the earnings, the earnings exist. They're real and they're paying off half a million dollars a year. That's real. So whether the price is jumping up and down around that, there's always this anchor, which is fundamentals. Now compare that to gold or Bitcoin or art or wine. And there's not the same thing. The only reason the price of those things change is based on attitudes and perceptions of those things. Now, of course, I'm not saying that income producing assets, people can't feel differently. For example, you know, factories could go out of fashion for some reason. Oh, I don't want to own a factory. They're too whatever, dirty or this or that. We can make something up, right? Let's say investors just decide to give up on factories. And guess what? The price of that factory goes from 10 million to 1 million. And now it seems like a bargain. But at the end of the day, if it's still producing that half a million dollars a year in profit, that's something real that people can touch. It's real. It's going to pay you out no matter what. It's not just based on the the whims of the market, right? So to speak. I'm not saying you should never own gold or never own crypto or never own art or wine. I own all of those, all of those things. Or not, I don't own gold. But I own crypto and art. I've dabbled in wine and thought about other things like that. But Mostly, I just try to keep that like 10 to maybe 15% of my portfolio, all of those non-income producing assets. So I say 85 to 90% of your portfolio should be in, you know, income producing assets. So that's things like stocks, small businesses, real estate, investment properties, REITs, all these. There's a bunch of different things I talk about in the book. If you want to invest in royalties or something, that's that's another one you can do. And I just do that because there's income streams associated with them, right? Bonds, all these things have income streams. And so for me, it's really just about like, finding something that has some anchor to reality and paying me versus like, I have to do it completely based on the price action. Now I'm not saying you can't make money doing that. Like the entire crypto space made money completely on price action. I'm not saying there's no fundamentals or no use case there, but the use case isn't always necessarily linked to cash flows. There are exceptions to that. There are times where you can take your crypto coins and stake them and earn money because you're providing liquidity and all this. I don't want to get into all the super crypto things. And there are ways of turning these non-income producing assets into income producing assets, but that's not their main use case, right? There are uses for these things. I'm not saying they're not useful. I'm just saying they don't necessarily provide a cash flow. And that is the thing that I have to have. I feel more secure owning income producing assets. And I think most people will feel more secure owning income producing assets over the long haul. Yeah, you want to dabble in those things? I don't care. I just think just keep it to a smaller percentage of your portfolio. You know, I've looked at the data on a lot of this stuff. Even when I I ran a, a simulator, where I was trying to figure out like what's the optimal portfolio when I when Bitcoin first did this big run up in 2017, mm-hmm. and it said it was like. And remember, this is like the perfect solution. It was like if we went back from like 2010 to 2017 or something, it was like the best thing you could have done was like 55% stocks, like. 40% or 43% US bonds and like 2% Bitcoin or something. So it was in there, but it was just like very small because of how risky it was or something. It's just thinking about that. And I think that's kind of the 
the philosophy I like to use. And I don't think there's any right mix of this. I just think when you're investing, you've got to have income producing assets. You said you keep your own portfolio about 10 to 15 percent speculative and the rest are income producing assets. How much weight do you give individual stocks within that 85 percent of your portfolio that is comprised of income producing assets? So right now I'm actually only like 10% with like art and crypto right now. Probably Mm -hmm. 10% of my net worth is in those two. Might even be less than that if I think about it. It might just be like 8%. But of all of my assets, I have 1% individual stocks. And in the book, and this is the funniest part. So in chapter 12, I say do not buy individual stocks. And I still (laughs) stay by that statement. (laughs) I did buy both the stocks I bought. I'm not going to say the names. I've said them on other podcasts and stuff. I'm not here to pump them or anything like that. (laughs) I bought two individual stocks. One was... A bunch of my friends did. And I said, okay, let's do it. I put like like half a percent of my net worth in it. And then the other one, I put like another half percent in. Uh-huh. And they're both down bad, very badly <laughs> at the time of this recording because tech stocks have been destroyed. And so one's down like 70%, one's down like 60% or something. They're both very down very badly. I recommend you read that chapter and realize like I was right all along about that <laughs> thing and I never should have done it. However, despite that, I think you can do it for fun. And so I think having one, a couple percent of your portfolio and 5%, even in individual stocks, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think the bulk of people's money shouldn't be in individual stocks because it's very risky, not just the performance piece of it, but also because like, you're not going to know if you're good at it. So if you're really trying to do it as like a, uh, like, oh, I'm really good at investing my own money. Look, I bought all these stock picks. I'm so good at it. I think it's really hard to tell if you're actually good at it, if you're just lucky and you're not going to know for a long time. And by the time you find out, if you find out you're not good, it's not a great look. There's a lot of people who started buying in 2020 and did even better in 2021 and found out in late 2021 that they're not as good as they thought they were. And so that's a kind of a big wake up call. I think we're starting to see that happen now. So yeah, I try to keep individual stocks. I, I actually, in my mind, individual stocks are income producing assets, but in my mind, I try to put them into the non-income producing assets because it's like, it's, they're speculative in my mind, but they definitely are income producing or they're supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. No, I I have that same uh, kind of mental grouping where I Mm -hmm. associate owning individual stocks and owning cryptocurrency in the same mental bucket, even though cryptocurrency is speculative. It's more analogous to, I think, a foreign currency exchange. Owning individual stocks, of course, you are owning an income producing asset. You're taking ownership in a company in a very fundamental way. But given the volatility, given the risk, given the unpredictability of how it's going to go. I, I, I'm i just like you. I have that same mental bucketing of this is the portion of my portfolio that is purely for play, playtime. Mm-hmm. And then this is the portion of my portfolio that's actually strategic. Yeah, I agree. And I think most people, if they think like that, they'll do fine. I think it's, you just got to, what's the percentage, what's the split you exactly do? And so I think most people, even there's a lot of people I know that dabble in crypto and stuff like that, and they sell like 80% of their money in index funds and stuff. I'm like, that's the way to go. If you're yeah. going to do low cost index fund, it's like, yeah, you're messing around with 20%, but it won't necessarily be catastrophic if that even all went to zero. Now, that would still be terrible to lose 20% of your money, but imagine if it's 100% of your money. Now that's really, really scary stuff. Right, exactly. Let's walk through some of the different income producing assets that uh, a person can invest in and sort of walk through, again, the pros and cons of each. Yeah. So there's stocks, obviously. It's the traditional, my favorite and my, you know, because I think they're very easy to own and trade. There's low maintenance. You don't have to do anything. You just own them and that's it. Generally, pretty good historic returns. The cons is that there, there's high volatility there. Valuations can change very quickly. That's why I said, like, you know, one day people think all these tech stocks are going to the moon and next day they're like, oh, these things have no earnings. Now they're down 70, 80 percent. That's yeah. what happens in stocks, right? Right. So diversifying is the key there. Yeah. Can we talk about farmland, royalties? I mean, these are the things that we don't hear about very often. (laughs) Yeah, so obviously stocks, bonds, investment property, REITs. The REITs are just real estate investment trusts. You're owning real estate. Someone else is running it for you, obviously. Instead of owning an individual property, it's like a diversified thing. So then there's farmland. That's something I've kind of dabbled in a little bit. The, The issue with that, so you can own a farmland REIT. That's probably the easiest way for most people to do it. However, I don't want to like name any services or stuff out there. You can just search like farmland investing and you'll find a bunch of ads on Google. You'll find all of those. Those are actually very interesting because they're, they have a lower correlation with traditional financial assets and they still provide a lot of like, they can provide income. There's income you can get in different ways from the sale of the property by itself, the yield of what the farm actually produces, right? That's another way you can have income and you'll have distributions paid out over time during certain deals you'll have. 
So yeah, and because they're not correlated as much, like if the stock market crash doesn't mean that farmland prices are necessarily going to crash, right? And usually they're illiquid. You buy them and you wait a long time to kind of see your money back. Because of that, it's a it's a different return stream. That I think is cool. So that's something to check out a lot. But a lot of those, if you're doing like farmland on those uh, on those different sites where you can invest in like a crowdfunding platform, they're required to be an accredited investor. So that's going to be like you have to have a million dollars or you have to have two hundred thousand dollars or more in income for the last two to three years. So the accreditation status is a thing. Small businesses, you guys know what that is. You have to usually find people to do that, to be an angel investor or something like that. And then lastly is like royalties. I mean, I think royalties are interesting. If you search royalty investing, you can find a lot of those firms out there as well. But I think that's interesting because they're kind of like individual stocks in a way because you're buying, like you have to bet on like, oh, I'm I'm betting on this particular song is going to do well over the next five <laughs> or 10 years or this particular piece of art or something, right? And so a very piece of content is going to do well. It's interesting. So it's kind of like individual stock investing. So I think for most people, you're going to have you're going to have, to have more money available to kind of get into these. But it's interesting to me because like, I don't know if you're just into music or art or something. It's another way to invest and kind of have yourself aligned with that. Right. That's another thing to think about. So, yeah, so I'd say farmland, check out royalties. The other one, too, is like creating your own products. So this is something where like you have something that becomes an income producing asset for you. Right. And so that's kind of related to what we we're discussing earlier with discussing how to raise your income, whether you're going to sell your own product that can be an income producing asset, right? So thinking about that, if there's something you're really passionate about creating something that you can sell to people, whether that's digital products, which are now, it's very easy to sell those things on Gumroad, or if you're self-publishing a book, you can do that on Amazon, all sorts of different ways you can do things like this. So those are the big ones that I throw out there. You don't have to do all of them, just consider them, just look at them. Say, does this seem right for me? Do the fees seem right? Does this seem right? You go through everything and Kind of just see what fits what fits your profile. Right. The the royalties one was really interesting. I've I've never heard anybody talk about that before. And you give the example of the the song Empire State of Mind yep. by Jay-Z and Alicia Keys. And someone bought the rights to that for $190,000, uh, the ro- the rights to the royalties mm-hmm. produced from that song for the next 10 years. And in that example, I mean, yeah, it, it's absolutely easy to see. You're betting that that song is going to stay popular and relevant. And you're mm-hmm. betting that the royalties that it made last year will be comparable to or improved over the next 10 years. Like, you know, you're essentially betting on the the long-term viability of a song. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that's one of the things about this. And I have no idea how they, they probably, there's people out there probably model like the decay of royalty. So in this, in the particular, I'm going to read from the example. So in the year prior, before it was sold, uh, that song, Empire State of Mind, earned $32,733 in royalties. I'm surprised it was only that much. I, yeah. I thought it would be a lot more. Well, I mean, it's one song. I mean, it's a big song, but it's one song. There's so many songs out there, right? So it's like, and they paid 190000 for it. If the royalties remain constant for the next 10 years, that's an 11.2% return you're getting on your money. It's as if if I gave a bank $190,000 and they gave me thirty two grand a year for the next 10 years, that's an 11% return. Now, there's no bank in America that would do that, right? But it, maybe the royalties go downside over time, so the, the final return will be smaller. But if something were to happen to Jay-Z or Alicia Keys, you know, God forbid, the, 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 you'd get way more royalties because people would be listening to that song, you know? And so... That's the thing to think about when you're investing in royalties is like if anything happens to the artist, like the, there's could be all sorts of stuff that happens for the song, whether that's good or bad or vice versa. So I obviously don't want anything like that, but it's just one of the risks or benefits of royalty investing is to kind of think about how trends change. I mean, if someone were to get canceled, maybe stuff, people stop listening to those songs altogether. That's the other thing. You got to think about both sides of the equation. Wow. And, and I guess in, in that way, there's also some crossover in terms of investing in art. But of course, art is not income producing and royalties are. But with art also, you have that same issue where the popular sentiment about the artist can influence the perceived value of that piece of art for better or for worse. Of course, that's completely true. And so I actually do invest in some art, but it's like, once again, it's like it's crowdsourced. Well, I can't afford a Basquiat on my own, um, but I do own one through, you know, a crowdsourced platform. You can own non-income producing assets. There's nothing wrong with that. I just Mm -hmm. think like you got to just be careful because not everything – because you don't know what the people are going to feel about pricing. And if you just, if you happen to sell at a bad time, you're, I mean, during the Great Depression, like there's so many rich people end up selling their houses for, you know, pennies on the dollar because they just needed money. And there was no one that could afford these really expensive things. Like how many people can afford $10 million paintings? Not many, right? So the people that are buying those things are probably only going to do it in a good market. If the market turns bad, like they're not going to be willing to spend a lot of money. So you could take a real hit on that. So that's, you got to be careful when you're thinking about those types of things. So that's the only downside of investing in non-income producing asset. Right. But in an inflationary environment where people are more likely to park their money into 
tangible items, such as jewelry and art and, and houses, in the types of tangible items that historically have survived periods of high inflation. I mean, that's sort of the other, I don't want to say market timing component to think about, but the, the you know, macroeconomic timing component to think about, at least. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. All those things to think about, right? And so when, it talks, when you're talking about inflation investing, I mean, I didn't really get into this in the book as much, but mm -hmm. I've written on this on the blog and it's like, you know, equities generally are the best bet for most people most of the time. You know, REITs are also pretty good. Real estate's pretty good for that. Home prices, things like that are good. The other thing, if you really think inflation is going to stay high for a very long period of time, then that's, you would, in theory, take out some debt, you know? And why would you take out debt? Because that debt's going to get inflated away. If the cost is fixed, but the money supply is just deteriorating, you know, over time, then like you're going to be paying back in depreciated paper. And it's one right. of those things where, I mean, people who did that in like, I'm not, we're, I'm not saying we're going to have a hyperinflation again, it's silly, but any sort of thing, you know, in history where people were literally paying back, you know, they took out a loan to buy a business and then they'd pay it back like a couple months later. And it's like, I own the, I basically got the business for nothing. Right. And it's kind of crazy to think that that could happen because the currency depreciated so quickly. But yeah, so those are the ways to kind of fight inflation uh, with investing. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for spending this time with us. Where can people find you if they'd like to know more about you and your work? My website is of dollarsanddata.com, all one word of dollarsanddata.com, or you can just find me on Twitter. My at is at dollarsanddata, and my DMs are open, so feel free to send me a message or questions or whatever. I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you, Nick. What are three key takeaways that we got from this conversation? Number one, the save invest continuum. First, let's start with the problem around how savings is discussed in popular culture. When you come across boilerplate advice that says, for example, save 10% of your income, save 20% of your income, regardless of whatever X percentage is, that advice often presupposes, number one, that your income will stay relatively consistent over time, and number two, that people of all income levels are able to capture the same savings rate, when in reality, as we all know, the more you make the less marginal utility each additional dollar has, which means that the more you make, the easier it is to save. Saving 20% of your income on a $40,000 annual salary is not even nearly the same, non-comparable to saving that same percentage of your income on a $200,000 salary. Now, in addition to this, the importance of Factors that impact your investment portfolio, your asset allocation, your asset location, meaning the tax efficiency of where you hold which assets, these types of considerations have different impacts at different portfolio levels. If you have a relatively small portfolio, tweaking your asset allocation is not going to matter as much. By contrast, if you have a massive portfolio, large enough such that the returns on your portfolio dwarf the amount that you could reasonably save in a given year, then paying attention to your financial capital at that point in your life makes more sense than paying attention to what you can produce through human capital. And so where all of this is going is that there are going to be different points in your life, depending on your income level, how far you are into your career, your earnings opportunity, the size of your investment portfolio, all of these factors will determine whether it makes more sense to focus on your income, your savings rate, or tweaking your investments. There are many levers you can pull, and the most optimal lever will be context-dependent. In order to create a simple rule around assessing where you are within this context, Nick proposes the following. If your expected savings are greater than your expected investment income, then focus on savings. If not, then focus on investing. You're going to see over time in future years, if you do this right, like when you're older, you can lose more money in a year from your investment returns than you could ever expect to save. Like if there's a bad year in the market, like there's nothing you could do to like make up for that. Like let's say you have a $10 million investment portfolio, hypothetically, this is a really extreme case, right? A 10% drop is a million dollars. Like how are you going to say, save a million dollars after tax in a year? It's not possible for most people unless you have a very, very high paying job. For most people, let's say you could, even if you could save 100,000, which is a lot of money, that's still 10X more. You know, taking a 10% drop, that's not that outrageous. Like those things happen pretty often. 
I think when you think of it that way, you start to realize like, oh my gosh, no wonder, like your investments don't really matter as much when you have very little invested. But as you kind of have a lot more invested, that's all that matters because it can have a bigger impact on your wealth than anything you do personally. If what you can reasonably expect to save in a given year exceeds what you can reasonably expect to earn through your investments, then focus on earning and saving. Don't waste hours obsessing over your asset allocation or your expense ratios. Focus instead on the gap between what you earn and what you spend. Focus on growing that gap. If, by contrast, your investment portfolio can produce gains that exceed any amount that you could reasonably save in a given year, then turn your attention to managing that portfolio well. And if you're somewhere in the middle, you've got to do both. That is key takeaway number one. Key takeaway number two, the 2x rule. Oftentimes, the world of personal finance can make us feel guilty about any given splurge. Once you get caught up in compounding interest charts, it's easy to fall into the simplistic trap of thinking, I could take this trip to Greece, or I could take the same $5,000 that that trip would cost, invest it for the next 40 years with an 8% compounding return, and have this much more in the year 2062. And once you've trained yourself to view every purchase through the lens of the compounding return that you're giving up, well, now you have a new problem to work through. Now you've pendulum swung a little too far to the other side where parting with money becomes an act of emotional anxiety. And so if you need to eliminate spending guilt, if you need to give yourself permission to enjoy the present moment in whatever form that that might take, then try this. Whenever you make a splurge type of purchase, take that same quantity of money and either invest it or donate it. This principle actually helps people on both sides. If what you're trying to do is eliminate spending guilt, this can help you do that because you know that you're matching dollar for dollar your splurge with your investments or donations. But also, if you have the tendency to overspend, you spend too much and you want to make sure that you can actually quote unquote afford that splurge that you want to splurge on, well, saving up double the amount before you make the splurge, which is essentially what the 2x rule prompts you to do, ensures that you don't overspend. So it simultaneously eliminates spending guilt for those of us who have a hard time parting with our money and also ensures that you save double the amount that you're splurging for those who may be a little too splurge happy. I think there's a lot of stuff in the personal finance space where a lot of people are guilted into, you know, you have to, oh, you don't buy your coffee, you're paying away a million dollars. You've heard, I mean, you've heard a lot of these things, you know, you should reuse your dental floss or make your <laughs> yes. own laundry. So and I've heard it all. I'm like, oh, what is this the new thing that they're pushing? Right. And so I know I've read your work, Paul. And I know you're against a lot of this guilt stuff. You can't afford this. You can't afford that. I, I understand you're you're all against that stuff as well. And so for me, I think I am trying to come up with different ways that people, different tricks people can use to kind of get them out of that guilt. There's this spending guilt that's mm -hmm. out there. And so one of the tricks I use, if I'm ever splurging, it's not for something like when I go to buy eggs or something, I don't care about that, right? But like if I'm splurging, like if I want to take myself out, go out for a nice dinner, buy myself a nice pair of shoes or something, right? Whatever it is, if I ever spend a, a large amount of money, let's say I'm going to spend $300, 400 bucks, whatever it is, I make sure to take the same amount of money and I either invest it, right? So let's say, so if I'm going to buy a $300 pair of shoes, like a nice pair of dress shoes, I will take another $300, so 2X my original purchase price, and I will invest it in something or I can donate it. There's different ways you can do this to kind of get rid of the guilt. So you don't feel guilty about buying the shoes because you're like also investing for your future or you're also helping a good cause. And so key takeaway number two is the 2X rule. Finally, key takeaway number three, save half of your future real raises, meaning your inflation-adjusted raises. If you make a practice of saving half of the raises that you receive in the future after adjusting for inflation, then you will simultaneously be able to enjoy a little lifestyle escalation while also creating a pathway for that lifestyle escalation to be maintainable in your retirement. 
you're basically taking someone who's like in a steady state, hey, I'm saving X dollars per year, I'm making it to my retirement goal, they're on basically a path, they're on this like equilibrium, perfect world where you get the same investment return every year, you're saving X dollars per year, you're moving to this path, right? So you can just imagine like someone's in a perfect equilibrium state, they're gonna hit their retirement, they're gonna spend you know, 4% of your retirement, et cetera, and everything's perfect. Obviously this is not realistic, but just go with it for now. Right. Now let's say there's a, a positive shock to the system. And when I say positive shock, I just mean you get a raise, you get a bonus, right? So what should you do to make sure you still land at the same equilibrium, right? So you're saying, well, if I got a raise or a bonus, then that's only good, right? Because if I save the entire raise, then I can just retire earlier. That's one option. But what if you want to spend a little bit of the raise? Like, you know, if you spend all of the raise, the problem is you're actually going to retire later. It's very counterintuitive. Saying, how is that possible? How of me spending all of my raise means I'm going to retire later? Well, assuming you want to spend the same amount of money over time, right? You want to have some sort of like lifestyle Maintenance. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. maintenance, exactly, you know, over time. Assuming that's true, if you're spending this raise, you know, you weren't spending that money in the past, but now you are, that means you have to save more to keep spending at that level in retirement. Saving half of your future raises and bonuses pairs nicely with the 2x rule. When you save half and you invest or donate the other half, you know that you are managing lifestyle inflation or lifestyle creep. You're not denying it which is what the more hardcore enthusiasts of the frugal movement often try to chastise people into doing. You're not depriving yourself of any type of lifestyle escalation. You're simply managing it in a controlled way. And if you're matching dollar for dollar, each dollar of lifestyle inflation with each dollar of investment, then you are building contributions that will support your ability to maintain your new escalated lifestyle in perpetuity. And so this principle of saving half, this is the third key takeaway from this conversation with Nick Majuli. The title of Nick's book, Just Keep Buying, is essentially another way of reminding us to continually dollar cost average, but it says so in a way that's far more motivating. And it also speaks to the heart of what to do to build a great portfolio Keep accumulating income-producing assets. And so long as you consistently just keep buying, just keep accumulating income-producing assets, do that consistently over time, and most likely, you'll be good. Personal finance media can dig into all the nuances of how to optimize this, but at its core, when you zoom out to the biggest picture level, the primary takeaway is to just keep buying, just keep accumulating assets and get rid of any liabilities that constantly drain you. Plug the holes in the bucket and then let the bucket accumulate water and do that consistently for decades and you're likely to be set. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do three things. Number one, share it with a friend or a family member. That's the single most important thing that you can do to spread the message of investing, wise money management, and the importance of taking control of both your money and your life. So share this episode with someone you know. Number two, please open up whatever app you're using to listen to this episode and hit the follow button so that you don't miss any of our amazing upcoming shows. By the way, two weeks from now, Bill Bengen, the guy who came up with the 4% rule, he's going to be our next guest. So make sure that you are subscribed to this podcast so that you catch that interview and all of our amazing interviews that are coming up after that. And while you're in that app, number three, please leave us a review. I want to give a shout out, by the way. I just came back from going on book tour with my buddy, Joe Salcihai. We went to five cities in six days. And I want to give a shout out to a listener called It's Me, Petey, who wrote a review on Apple Podcasts that says, quote, even better in person. I always learn something listening to Paula. And it was so great to see her live on tour in support of the new Emily Guy Birkin and Joe Salci High book, Stacked. Thank you, Petey. It was great meeting you too. And thank you for taking the time not just to come out to the event, but also to leave a review. So please, to everyone who's listening, if you're enjoying this episode or if you're enjoying this podcast, please go into whatever app you're using to listen to this show and please leave us a review. And check out Nick's book as well, Just Keep Buying. He is an original thinker in the world of personal finance, and there are not many of those. That is a rare and therefore valuable attribute. 
So he's a name that you'll keep hearing about if you follow the personal finance space. He's a name that you're going to keep hearing about for decades to come. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the Afford Anything podcast. My name is Paula Pant. You can subscribe to the show notes at affordanything.com slash show notes. I'm so grateful that you're part of the community and I will catch you in the next episode.